This is the podcast Person of Interest, where we meet extraordinary people with a story to tell. In this episode, Mike Collier talks to academic and researcher Morten Ebbe Yule Nielsen about corporate social responsibilities role and the environment. Welcome back to the Stockholm School of Economics here in the center of Riga for another of our occasional series of podcasts. Uh, we are speaking to another person eminent in their field, someone who knows a subject backwards, forwards and every which way. I'm delighted to welcome to SSE Riga today, Morten Ebbe Yule Nielsen from Denmark. Welcome, Thank Morten. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Morten is Professor of Applied Philosophy and Head of Practical Philosophy Research Group at Copenhagen University. Right. Uh, Associate professor, I should add. Okay, yeah. thank you for the yeah. correction. Um, but I'm very impressed that uh, there are qualifiers for the use of philosophy in both those titles. So we have applied philosophy and practical philosophy, both of which address the classic uh, question that people are generally asked, which is uh, philosophy, what use is that? Yeah. So if we could just get that one out of the way, what use is philosophy? Well, that's a huge question, <laughs> but, uh, but I think uh, as a guidance to our decisions, so reflecting upon what principles, what values, uh, so on and so forth, should we use in our uh, deliberation before we take decisions. So to inform and qualify uh, our decisions about every action, how we, how should we go around do businesses, how should we uh, have institu- how should our institutions be, how should we treat each other. Excellent. I'm really glad that we got that out of the way at the beginning of the podcast rather than the end and yeah. then use it as some kind of cold uh, climax. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, a little bit more about yourself. How did you uh, follow the path into this uh, academic area of, of, uh, of interest? Uh, yeah, from the, from the beginning of my intellectual career, I was interested in politics. Uh, but I moved into psychology, did a BA in psychology, found the... Uh, found a lot of the issues in psychology kind of under illuminated so why do we accept this theory why do we accept this way of uh, viewing people uh, the, the psychological the mental uh, so I, uh, I did st- took some courses in philosophy and found it was uh, more interesting for me and it could also more easily be combined with my interest in in, yeah, in the question of uh, how should we Uh, treat each other. How? What kind of institution, state institution, should we have? So on and so forth. Uh, so I just gradually went from psychology to philosophy. Uh, did a PhD in Copenhagen University, mostly written in Oxford, uh, and then yeah, from then on. Was that a, an easy transition to make? I mean, it's the sort of thing one could almost imagine maybe some of your colleagues in the psychological aspect thinking, well, you're kind of copping out a little bit by moving into this rarefied atmosphere. Uh, yes and no. I mean, in, uh, in Denmark, there's always been a kind of uh, good relationship between psychology and, and philosophy. So originally, you, you couldn't be a professor in psychology. You had to be a professor of philosophy. So no kind of uh, uh, nagging between these two groups. Um, so so not not really no tra- no big transition costs. No. And w- were there any particular currents within philosophy, any particular you know schools of thought or individuals who particularly inspired you? <clears throat> yeah, I guess basically what I was, was most most dissatisfied with in psychology was uh, social constructivism. So the idea that neither uh, biology or uh, something that is not entirely mental plays a role. So that was the kind of dominant idea, still is, I think, in in many psychology uh, departments that we shouldn't look at biology, we shouldn't look at society. It's simply something, you know, culture and science, stuff like that. And I feel, well, that can't really be true. When you look at different cultures, different societies, we have so much in common. So it was, if it's only the social that constructs reality, why is it that we have so many things in common rather than things that kind of divide us? Uh, and so I thought and that was particularly under-examined uh, or just taken as a piece of doxa, as you say in philosophy, a kind of un, uh, unexamined truth. Uh, so that was really what irritated me about psychology and I thought no well then uh, since I'm not qualified doing biology or, or, or become a medical doctor I should probably go for philosophy to to uh, to look at these things 
So that's interesting. So in a way, it's the, the fact that you know, philosophy by its nature is exploring... Well, it doesn't have control of all the inputs, as it were. I mean, no. It, no? It doesn't have. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I completely agree. Yeah. <laughs> Whereas, I guess, psy uh, psychology, uh, wearing more of a sort of scientific hat, is, is being a bit more determinist, a bit more, we have all the inputs, therefore we can reason all the outputs or work backwards. Yeah, I, I think I get your drift. Um, so, basically, I think it's very important for philosophers to respect science and the scientific method. So all the different sciences, social sciences, uh, hardcore sciences, medical sciences, whatever, they give us a lot of input. They, they give us the data that we should kind of reflect upon, mm. not exclusively, but to a very far uh, extent. But then philosophers can kind of have the privilege of thinking about, well, is this the right way of arranging data? Is this the why? Do we have all the relevant data? Should we look at some other things? Should we interpret them in a different way than is the dogma within this and yeah. that science? So we have it's kind of a luxury thing. So other people do the hard work, <laughs> and we kind of try to um, uh, arrange it, uh, makes make a system that is uh, plausible, so on, or maybe say. Well, here's just a case where you can't find any plausible system of uh, arranging your data. That's sometimes the, the result as well, right? And a couple of days ago, uh, you gave a lecture here, moving on to the sort of specific reason why you're, yeah. you're, you're here at SSE Riga at, at the moment. Um, you gave a lecture titled, Why CSR is Still Relevant to Address Climate Change. Right. Now, we have a, a couple of big concepts in there, one being climate change, which of course is very, very current at the moment, dominating a lot of the headlines, but also CSR, Corporate Social Responsibility, right. which to me, initially, sounds like something from about five years ago. Right. It, it, the title could have been Business Ethics, and I, don't, I, I, mm. I mean, ethics is not going to go away from business uh, any, uh, uh, at any point, uh, but so I have, a, I have a long-standing interest in Corporate Social Responsibility and Business Ethics. Uh, particularly when it leans toward uh, issues about distribution or uh, rights, stuff like that. How, what kind of rights should uh, uh, employers have? What kind of uh, duties do employees have? So on, so forth. Um, so, what are kind of the institutional rights and duties of businesses? That's that's a long-standing interest of mine. Mm. It just so happens that CSR has for sometime being the clearest paradigm of expressing um, academic uh, thoughts about these things. Um, so, so, so CSI, is a, that's an old interest of mine, and uh, climate change is a new interest of mine. Uh, so combining the, giving me, this is actually give me the opportunity to, to merge thoughts about these two things. Mm. Uh, and I was very happy to be able to give that talk and 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 and, and, and you spend some time preparing for that. So uh, yeah, it's interesting because business ethics, ethics to me is a much more attractive <laughs> term. It kind of seems that's funny. Yeah, yeah. I guess I, I must be the exception to the to the rule there. I I, I don't know. I, it probably I, probably many share the same uh, view uh, or, or preconception that you do. Uh, yeah, but so. then when we're talking about corporate social responsibility as you understand it, uh, what are we talking about? And how does your definition maybe uh, reflect or not reflect the way that it has been maybe slightly abused as a term in the past? Right. So um, I'm pretty convinced that there are two uh, completely incompatible understandings of, of CSR. Uh, and, and the first one, you might, you might call it the, uh, the business school understanding or the strategic understanding. There you have corporate social responsibilities is simply the kind of social or environmental efforts that companies do in order to promote their own economic uh, baseline. So, uh, so we, as a corporation, we do something that looks very nice. You might sometimes call it greenwashing, mm. uh, uh, and, it, and it is nice. So we do something for the environment, or we do something about inclusion in the workplace of uh, disabled people or something like that. But basically, we do it because uh, we want to see a net profit of our effort. Uh, 
Or for marketing purposes. Uh, simply for marketing purposes, right? So you get more customers, or you attract better uh, personnel or, or whatever, uh, better partners. Or, so you have a nice image. Uh, and then there's kind of more the, you, you may say actually the business ethics or the kind of more philosophical way of approaching corporate social responsibility, where you actually take what is the, 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 the responsibility of businesses when they go about doing business. And of course, a lot of that is covered by law. So normally you define that sort of, uh, you, you may say, moral corporate, corporate social responsibility is defined as extra legal. What do some businesses mm -hmm. do on top of what is demanded by uh, national and international so regulation? So self-regulation yeah. uh, rather yeah. than... It's going that extra mile mm -hmm. or a couple of, sometimes a couple of miles or... And some, some, definitely some businesses are actually doing that. It's not kind of a phantom, uh, a mirage. Some, some, some companies are trying to take their responsibilities, moral responsibilities, seriously. But doesn't that then require some sort of agreement as to the means by which this can be benchmarked? If you say some companies are taking it seriously, clearly some aren't. I mean, one example, maybe the root cause of my uh, skepticism initially at the term, was I remember a few years ago, uh, a report being issued by, I think it was a Chamber of Commerce, I'd better not say which country is here in, in Latvia, about their suddenly discovered corporate social responsibility. And it just seemed to me that um, all that they included in the report was were instances of ways in which they had been not as bad as they might have been. <laughs> you know, we could have been real bastards, but in fact we're sure. just being quite profit-driven. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right, yeah. Yeah, it's, uh, I can't remember who's put the phrase like that, but somebody says, yeah, some businesses kind of believe that they, should, uh, they deserve praise for not doing bad things. Yes. And I'm not going to my wife and say, hey, I didn't strangle the cat today, please. <laughs> yeah, reward me. Reward yeah. me, right. Um, uh, but even, I, I mean... Yeah, it depends on kind of your framework. So uh, yeah, sorry, I, I rather lost the question in, in, in amongst that. It doesn't, doesn't there need to be some sort of agreement between companies that do take it seriously or other institutions which are taking it seriously as to how they can benchmark each other? In the sure. So the whole issue about uh, comparability. So how do you actually compare uh, businesses and their CSR efforts? It's enormously complicated. Mm -hmm. um, especially if you try to compare businesses in different sectors and so on, because it's, it's, it shouldn't come as a surprise that a petrol company has a larger negative contribution to climate changes than a software company. Uh, it shouldn't be, be a surprise that the software company is not doing as bad on animal testing as the cosmetics firm and so on and so mm. forth. So um, comparing across sectors can be, and, and businesses can be really, really tough but um, still you might have some frameworks where I say, so, okay, do you actually comply with regulation as a, as a starting point? Do you compromise regulation? Okay, fine, you didn't. That's, well, you, that's a good start. Do you do some effort to, for instance, uh, work against uh, discrimination or to have inclusion in the workforce? Uh, well, that's good. Do you try to address stuff about uh, bribery, corruption in your international dealings? So, you, do you actually have an effort to educate your foreign partners in anti-corruption, uh, so on and so forth? So, 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 depending on what you're looking for, you can have some rough comparisons between, even between businesses that are quite different from each other. Um, now, there's like the Global Compact, uh, the GRI initiative, so on and so forth, are trying to have these various stand ISO, this and this and that. Mm. Um, doesn't really work, but it's, I mean, it's, uh, some of these things are important steps towards something like comparability across businesses. And I guess with you talking more specifically about climate change, when you focus yeah. on a single issue like that, it must make the comparison a little bit more uh, straightforward. Yeah. Uh, now, that's an interesting uh, theoretical, philosophical question. Should we just compare the brute uh, climate uh, gas emissions of a company 
or should be kind of adjusted. So say, okay, rice is a, rice is actually quite bad in in terms of uh, climate changes or climate gas emissions, but it serves a very uh, important purpose for as a food. So the fact that rice production uh, is more harmful for the climate may not mean that the rice sector per se is worse than some sector which is not uh, uh, producing a lot of climate house gases but but it's also i mean uh, it doesn't need to do that in order to make its product so we should kind of probably we should kind of adjust um, for the necessity and the importance of what you produce mm. And I guess that's making a small difference in the rice sector would also would have a far far larger net yeah. impact than yeah yeah yeah. So so you yeah. could really clean up the software industry, and it wouldn't make any kind of difference. Yeah. Maybe apart from the servers that are driven by blah blah blah, but 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 just reducing ten percent of the climate uh, gas emission from the rice production would make an sh- enormous difference to to our net result, right? Yeah. So with this in mind, I mean, could you perhaps give us a couple of examples uh, where this has been an effective measure or or might possibly be a model for for other companies and institutions to look at? Uh, Well, first, that's a bit beyond my field of expertise. Uh, And second, what I found is uh, some some various uh, recent reports saying, well, up to now, CSR has not been a very efficient tool in making changes uh, both generally and specifically on the climate uh, gas emission. But that does not preclude that it may be a a very efficient tool. And I think it can be because businesses, uh, producers, normally know more than, for instance, the state. I mean, they know the specifics. They have an idea of how to change things. If 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 we need to change things, we need to change them in this way. And they also have knowledge about partnerships and so on so um, so what would be really efficient is that uh, all businesses within one sector say the rice producing sector or something they go together and say okay we uh, please make some outside regulation we all accept that do it in this way that would be more, most efficient and we can have uh, we can com- compete on equal terms because this competing on equal terms is of course extremely important for businesses uh, and just having a couple of, say, corporations involved in whatever, going together, uh, doing some some nice things about climate uh, gas reduction, then other can free other companies can free ride and produce their, their stuff cheaper. Yeah. So that'll in the long run it'll undermine the efforts of those isolated good attempts to do something. Well, that was the point. The point I was I was going to raise in that you need a tremendous amount of cohesion within sectors or within right. competing companies, do you not? Yeah. I mean, so how, how do we square that? Doesn't it just come back to regulation? I mean, regulation will have to come into the picture at some stage. Yeah. But a clever business sector, the kind, I think these should be proactively trying to find out how could we have something that allows us to compete on equal terms and also actually does something to reduce climate gas emission. And then they could present this to lawmakers, to policymakers, uh, to the press, so on. Listen, please make some regulation, but do it in this way because that'll allow our be- so we can have uh, people in work, we can produce money, we can produce goods, we can do it in a climate-friendly manner, and we can just punch everybody who doesn't uh, <laughs> comply, right? So, so I think a clever business leader would try to go ahead of regulation and and. Um, not to preempt it, but to qualify the the, uh, the kind of uh, regulation being made, and this is actually happening as we speak. Some companies are, are, are asking to the EU, so please, could you have could we have some regulatory baselines here that are equal, so we can compete on equal terms, and would allow us to have uh, really efficient uh, reductions. And would, this is this is where I see the the kind of voluntary aspect of corporate social responsibility. Combined with a sort of well, common sense, clever. If I mean, if we are involved in doing the regulation, it's not going to be as stupid as if mm. some bureaucrat in the EU just forces everything from uh, uh, upon us from the top. Do you think there might be some potential then for cooperation of, of, of some sort between, say, the climate strike actions which are happening at the moment, which are 
and quite confrontational between private sector and, and members of the public saying, mm. look, something's got to be done, do something. And actually, in many cases, sort of calling for much tighter regulation, um, which is a sort of oppositional system. Is there an opportunity maybe for these sort of more progressive thinkers, you're saying, to bridge this gap and uh, mobilise the clear anger and uh, desire which is there for change um, in a way which is sort of more constructive? You, you probably should ask a social psychologist <laughs> about this. My hunch is that uh, probably these things are better left in the hands of clear-headed, calm adults. Because if you try to involve, the, you may say, the avant-garde of the activists, then they just say, oh, it's capitalism trying to hijack our project and so on. So they'll just mm. be very... And, and it's not going to satisfy, you know, the 15-year-old uh, really... Uh, radical on this issue but if we want to have some solutions and not just some protests we need to go in this direction uh, so I just think just go ahead make climate strike so on and then some adults should actually do something about the problem and maybe not talk that much about it because <laughs> uh, just try to be constructive but I don't know if some sort of grand alliance is, is possible not between the, the extreme activists and and, and businesses, but among adults. Yeah, I mean, when you have such polarized opinions, sometimes if someone can stand in, you know, step into the middle, it might be a, a way of uh, providing. Yeah, as, I mean, the most efficient way of diffusing this kind of uh, polarization would to be to produce some results. Mm. <laughs> that would be a, a very good first step, because then people say, okay, this actually the system does work. Actually, businesses, I mean, business leaders are not happy to think about their grandchildren living with a five degree increase in, in, in temperature. They are also uh, people that look themselves in the mirror every morning. And, and, and to my ex in my experience, um, you, you really come around quite quickly the last couple of years mm. to this. So no, they are not uh, exceptionally eco-friendly and they don't care about the panda or something like that. But climate change, I mean, that's something, it's tangible, it's catastrophic. So, yeah, they are also motivated to do something about this. And just widening things out a little bit, and maybe if I can use the term business ethics again, which, as I said, I, I find a very attractive term mm, because it, is, uh, it, is, yeah. it, it kind of encourages you to dive into it a little bit more. I mean, when you speak with companies, institutions, individuals, are there any sort of buttons you can press which release maybe what's a pent-up interest in this subject? Because it does seem to me as if this is a, an issue which is making a bit of a comeback after, mm. after a while. Mm. People are actually eager and uh, want to be engaged with the ethical aspect of, of you know, working in a society, and a capitalist society in particular. Uh, yeah, I'm. I'm actually at, at least slightly optimistic on on, on, on that uh, account. I think it would be great if more business scholars uh, went together with some people from the technical sciences and some philosophers or people from political sciences uh, and come up with some came up with some uh, concrete suggestions that you could present to businesses and say, so, okay, you actually do have an interest in, in addressing this. Here's a way, here's uh, for, your, for your sector, why don't you go together with your friendly competitors and, and try to make this sort of deal for your business sector? And here's a business case, it wouldn't undermine your, uh, your profits. Here's a, an impact assessment, you would actually do something about mm. the problem. Uh, so, so instead of trying, to, you know, a lot of this is going on in a strangely kind of emotional way where we think that we can, oh, if we, uh, if our canteen just offers biodynamic food, it's going to do something about, no, it's not. Uh, if, if, if we reuse our paper, blah, 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 save lights, stuff like that, it doesn't make any difference. But coming up with something that, that, that is actually workable and could serve as a model for, for different sectors, for different businesses of different sizes. Business scholars should go together with other people and try to make something that you could actually present as a toolbox to uh, company owners, stockholders, CEOs, and so on and so forth, that, that, that would actually like to go down a more, a really effect, effective route and not just an emotionally feel-good kind of thing. 
I think, and I think this is happening uh, slowly but uh, steadily. Well, it's nice to finish on an optimistic, albeit cautiously optimistic. Cautiously like optimistic, that. but I think we shouldn't lose. Uh, we have tackled so many big issues. Just think about the uh, uh, what do you call it, refrigerator gases thing, the CFC gases. Took a couple of years to find a solution, and uh, no, we ju- we're not going to use that. We face it out. We have new stuff, and it's no no holes in the ozone. I layer. guess similar with uh, engine emissions as well. You know, the manufacturers yeah. said this is impossible to do this in five years. They all did it, no yeah. problem. Yeah, and we have technologies that are just too expensive, as regulation is now, that could have uh, carbon-free diesel engines, stuff like that. I mean. We do also have a lot of technologies, but they are too expensive as long as regulators don't press for introducing these uh, technologies. So we shouldn't panic, but we should act still. Yeah. Thank you very much for joining me today, Morten. Yeah, it was a pleasure. Thank you for listening. This podcast was produced by SSC Riga. If you'd like to learn more about the topic, visit the open course schedule at SSC Riga Executive Education. For more podcasts, find us on Spotify, iTunes or the platform of your choice. Remember, share this episode with your friends and colleagues.